Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm your host, Joseph Pierce. Thanks so much for joining me. And today we are going to be focusing on the greatest uh, writer of the 20th century, in my humble opinion, and uh, the author of the greatest work of the 20th century, not merely in my humble opinion, but in the uh, opinion of many others. In fact, it was when uh, this author's best known and best selling book, The Lord of the Rings, was published, uh, that um, that uh, a whole new genre of what we now call fantasy literature exploded upon the scene, most of which is not fit to be in Tolkien's or The Lord of the Rings' shadow. But my book on Tolkien, Tolkien, Man and Myth, are the first of uh, uh, three books I've written on Tolkien, more recently for Tan Books. I've written uh, Bilbo's Journey, uh, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Hobbit, and Frodo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings. But before that, I wrote a book called Tolkien, Man and Myth, which is a biography of Tolkien. And that book was provoked, prompted and provoked by uh, by the reaction of the critics to to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings emerging as the greatest work of the 20th century, according to several opinion polls and uh, national opinion polls in the UK. Uh, and the, the result of the re response of the self-styled literati to this success of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings was dismissive and contemptuous. Um, so one critic even said, this just shows the folly of teaching people to read. Now, the irony is it was quite clear to me from reading the banality of their responses that none of them had actually ever bothered to read The Lord of the Rings before passing judgment upon it. Such is pride and prejudice. But I thought that, uh, that I would come to Tolkien's defense um, and that, that that was what I said provoked me to write my first book on Tolkien, Tolkien, Man and Myth. What you need to understand about The Lord of the Rings is, as Tolkien said, and I'm quoting him here word for word, The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously at first, consciously in the revision. So if you want to understand The Lord of the Rings, on the deepest level, we have to understand it's fundamentally religious and Catholic. Uh, and again, my book, Frodo's Journey, looks at that dimension. Insofar as we have time, we will do so here, but I suspect we won't have much time for that. Um, you can also check out Tan Courses, the course on Tolkien, which I've taught for Tan, and where we go into much more detail on the, the Catholicism of Lord of the Rings. But I want to focus on the author here in the authority, look, I focus on Tolkien himself. Now, Tolkien said there was a scale of significance in his relate in, 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 in the relationship between him as author and his works. And um, he said the there's various things in the scale of significance, but the most important of the really significant factors, he says, is the fact that I am a Christian and in fact a Roman Catholic, which can be deduced from my stories. In other words, the most important thing about Tolkien we need to know if we want to understand his works is his Catholicism and that this can be deduced from his stories. We can see that Catholicism in his works. He said in, in, in that, uh, when talking about the scale of significance, he said that the fact I was born in the Shire in a pre-mechanical age and that this was important. Now, this is poetic license. Tolkien's not telling a lie, but he's not telling the literal truth either because he wasn't born in the Shire, by which he means rural England. Uh, he was born in South Africa, of all places, in a place called Bloemfontein, where his father uh, had moved for work uh, and the family had moved with him. Um, but uh, after a year or so there, after Sh uh, Tolkien's birth, the family re returned to England, or rather his mother and he and his brother returned to England. His father was due to return sometime after, once he had managed to tie up 
uh, the loose ends of the business venture out there, but he never returned because he, he tragically, he died. So that um, Tolkien was born uh, on January 3rd, 1892. His father died on February the 15th, 1896. So shortly after uh, Tolkien's uh, fourth birthday, he lost his father, that the family returned to England the previous year, 1895. So Tol Tolkien spent his first three years in South Africa. Probably the only connection to the Lord of the Rings from that period is that he was bitten while he was in South Africa uh, by a tarantula. Now, bear in mind how small he's going to be. I don't know what age he was when he was bitten by the tarantula, but he was only three when they returned home. So he was certainly small, a toddler. And if you're bitten by a spider that must have seemed as big as you are, <laughs> then it's not surprising perhaps that you might have had uh, an aversion for spiders. And we can't help but perhaps but see um, that some of the monstrous spiders in Tolkien's work, such as uh, Ungoliant in the Silmarillion and Shelob uh, in the uh, uh, Lord of the Rings and the giant spiders uh, in The Hobbit, uh, might have some arachnophobic connection to Tolkien's childhood experience in South Africa, although Tolkien did deny uh, that he was a, actually a, a, an arachnophobe, he had a fear of spiders. But what, when they moved to England, following the death of uh, the fa their father, obviously the family was was somewhat plunged into poverty and, re and reliant, dependent upon financial support from both his mother's family and also from his father's family. And they lived uh, in uh, Birmingham before moving to a village. So born in the Shire in a pre-mechanical age. Well, first of all, as I said, he was born in South Africa, hardly the Shire. But then he moved to Birmingham. And we have to understand about Birmingham, it was a village at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but by the time that um, Tolkien was living there at the beginning or the, at the end of the 19th century, it had become the second largest city in England. Uh, perhaps not quite. Then It was certainly growing very quickly. It is now the second largest city in England and, and it certainly was by the middle of the 20th century. So this you have this huge industrial city growing up uh, on a spot which had once been a village with and, and, and Tolkien and his family lived in a house, a small cottage, or not a small house, with factory chimneys within sight, with a with a, a railway line going around the back, with the, the the steam engines belching out soot and smoke, the factory chimneys belching out foot and smoke. No, he wasn't born in the Shire in a pre-mechanical age. So what does he mean when he says that? He's talking about a, a, a golden age, uh, a magical period of his childhood, when they moved from Birmingham, from this big industrial belching city, to a small village called Sarehole in Warwickshire, not far from Birmingham, but far enough to be a village with a village pond to play in, village trees to climb, and peace and quiet countryside and nature. Uh, and this was the Shire in a pre-mechanical age, which fired um, Tolkien's imagination and inspired the, uh, the, the depiction of the Shire in The Lord of the Rings. In 1900, when Tolkien is eight years old, old his mother converts to Catholicism. Uh, and this plunges the family from po poverty into penury because the families are so opposed to her conversion that they cut off financial support. So now the family is, 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 is in dire uh, straits. Um, and his mother dies only four years later in 1904 when Tolkien is only 12 years old. He becomes an orphan. And Tolkien was convinced that his mother's early death was a direct consequence of the way that she was treated following her conversion. So he says that my own mother was a martyr indeed, uh, um, dying uh, to ensure that, she, that he and his brother keep the faith. Uh, and 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 he, he talked of her death uh, in poverty, uh, too ill to receive viaticum, the last rites of the 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 the, 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 the Eucharist, in extremis. Uh, and because of this martyrdom of his mother's part, he said, and "This is written much later. I find it very hard when my own children stray away from the faith." So for. Tolkien, his mother, was had heroic virtue and was a martyr for the Catholic faith. 
It's no wonder that Tolkien remained a resolute Catholic for the remainder of his life. Uh, following the death of his mother, uh, Tolkien and his brother Hilary, um, uh, they had as their new guardian, Father Francis Morgan, uh, who had befriended Tolkien's mother. And uh, uh, he became the legal guardian. They were not particularly at home with the relative with whom they were living. So every morning they would cycle to the Birmingham Oratory, which uh, had been founded by John Henry Newman 50 or so years earlier. Um, slight, slightly less than that. Um, and um, would serve Father Morgan's mass every morning. Around this time as well, uh, in the summer of 1909, so Tolkien at this point would be 17, uh, he met uh, an, a fellow orphan, uh, Edith Bratt, who was three years older than he was, so she would have been 20, and they fell in love. Um, but Father Morgan was concerned that this love affair would would, in, it would uh, inhibit Tolkien's... Uh, uh, schooling and so he uh requested that that he did not see her until he was 21 years old this must have been very hard but tolkien showing amazing obedience agreed to that um when he on his 21st birthday he wrote to her only to discover that she was engaged to marry someone else but undeterred, uh, he went uh, and sought her out and persuaded her that she needed to not make that terrible mistake and that he was her Prince Charming and and he needed to, she needed to marry him, which she then did. They got married um, and in, immediately upon getting marriage, married, but uh, Tolkien went off to fight in World War I and in what he called the animal horror of the Battle of the Somme. Battle of the Somme is one of the bloodiest, most horrible uh, battles in the whole history of humanity. Um, the numbers, the number of people killed in very short periods of time was, was, was absolutely horrific. Tolkien, thankfully, was not one of them, um, but he was there uh, at the Battle of the Somme. By the time he left to go, across to the trenches uh his wife edith, edith was already expecting their first child uh, john who would go on to become a jesuit priest so having survived the war they would have three more children three sons and a daughter and uh the, we mustn't underestimate the importance of tolkien's role as pater familias as the father of a family in uh in his uh life and in his life as a writer he wrote a series of letters every Christmas, uh, allegedly from Father Christmas, uh, and would go to elaborate lengths to have his children continue to believe they were actually from Father Christmas, uh, even you know, as, as the children got older, including uh, getting the postman to deliver 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 the letter with a North Pole stamp on it, uh, and all, in one year even walking across the the lovely clean carpet in dirty boots because their children would think that father would never possibly do that because mother would kill him, uh, must be Father Christmas. So the, 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 the lengths he went to keep the magic of Christmas alive with his children um, in these Father Christmas letters, which have now been published and illust with illustrations and is absolutely delightful. But of course, the other thing about Pater, about Pater Familias is that uh, his first book to which we all, which we all know, The Hobbit, was written for his own children, um, for the entertainment of his own children. So it was as a father that he became an author. But for the day job, uh, he was also a philologist and a medievalist and an academic. So in other words, he taught, first of all, at the University of Leeds in Yorkshire, in the north of England, and then for many, many years at Oxford, a philologist, a lover of languages, a linguist. His expertise was particularly in Old English, the language of the Anglo-Saxons before the... Um, before the Norman Conquest in 1066. And he drew upon his knowledge of languages in general uh, and Old English in particular uh, in his uh, writing of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and also his knowledge as a linguist in inventing the Elvish languages. And again, it's the Tolkien's uh, being a linguist first and a storyteller second, if you like. You know, it, it, we can honestly say of Middle-earth in general and The Lord of the Rings in particular, that 
the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, not as in the Logos, not as in the word of God, uh, uh, particularly, but Tolkien invented a language, an elven language, elvish, um, and uh, he wanted people to speak it. So having had, having have, uh, having in, uh, created the word or the words of the language, he then had to make those words become flesh by uh, in, by enfleshing, incarnating people who can speak it. And so the stories were told so that his language could be spoken. The word and the words became flesh and dwelt amongst us in Middle Earth, talking following, if you like, the divine pattern in his creativity. Uh, in the 1920s, he formed a friendship with C.S. Lewis. Um, we'll talk about more about that in the next episode of The Authority, when C.S. Lewis will be our focus. Um, but when Lewis and Tolkien first met, Lewis was an atheist and very anti-Catholic. Lewis was born in Belfast, the most sectarian city uh, in uh, the Christian world, arguably. Um the, the, the divisions between Catholics and Protestants in Belfast and Northern Ireland would eventually were had uh, would, would be would would be lead to the war uh, civil war in Ireland and then the, the the so called troubles for thirty years, but this is this of course was more recently after the death of both men, but this was simmering, so the, you wouldn't have thought they had much in common Tolkien and Lewis uh, to, to form a friendship. What they had in common was a shared love of the Old North, um, particularly Old Norse. So the sagas written in the Old Norse language, the old Scandinavian language of the Vikings. Uh, and L Tolkien had formed a club called the Elder Eddar. Uh, sorry, not called the Eddar, called the, uh, the Coal Biter, which literally means those who bite the coal because they, they sit cl so close by the fire uh, during winter to read the Elder Eddar, the great uh, Old Norse saga. And uh, Tolkien's fellow linguists, philologists, could speak Old Norse and read it. Lewis couldn't particularly, but he asked nonetheless if he could come along to to these meetings and this reading. Uh, and uh, he was allowed, and with a crib, he got better at his Old Norse. When that when that club ceased to exist, following the the, the, the finishing of the reading of that of that saga, um, Lewis felt the need to continue this male camaraderie uh, and formed a group which became known as the Inklings, which is the most important literary group of the 20th century, with many uh, prominent members, um, mo but most prominent of all were Lewis himself and J.R.R. Tolkien. And every week, for many years, they would meet twice a week, once in Lewis's rooms in Magdalen College, Oxford, and once at the, a local pub, the Eagle and Child, uh, which they nicknamed the Burden Baby, uh, and they would read their own works and discuss literature, etc. Most significantly to the future of literature, perhaps, um, was a long night talk between Tolkien and Lewis and their friend Hugo Dyson on September the 19th, 1931, um, beginning in Lewis's rooms, but they, they also went out for a walk. And the subject of that long night talk was mythology. And Lewis said, but myths are lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver. In other words, that, um, that myths are, are, are just beautiful lies and we love them because they're beautiful, but they don't tell us the truth. Because they don't tell us the truth, they're ultimately worthless. Tolkien's response was, no, they are not lies. And then expounding upon his philosophy of myth, the love of wisdom to be found through story, um, uh, and showing how the, the gift of creativity is part of the imago dei in us. We are made in the image of God. And the imagination is the imagination, part of that creative image of God in us. And that we make by the law by which we are made. In other words, God is a creator. God's a poet, an artist, a composer. And we are, therefore, in our own creativity, in our own artistry, in our own poetry, um, in our own music, um, that we are uh, showing that divine image forth. And, he, and Tolkien said that the gospel is the true myth. Tolkien and Lewis never used the word myth in the modern sense of being a lie. Myth is merely, in its original sense, a story. So the gospel is the true myth, the true story, in which the, in which the story is not told with words, but with facts. 
um, that the, the, the history is his story, is God's story. And in the story of Christ is, is how the storyteller enters his own story. And this, this, this long night talk had such a profound influence upon C.S. Lewis that it um, was the final step upon his conversion to Christianity. Within a few weeks of that, he was writing to a friend that I have definitely started to believe in the Christian God and that my long night talk with Tolkien and, and Dyson had a great deal to do with it. So in 1937, as we said, uh, The Hobbit was published and um, a children's story. Um, and Lord of the Rings would begin uh, initially as a follow-up, as a children's story, but would grow up and grow out of control, if you like, and grow into this huge, big uh, work, which is certainly not for children only, uh, that's for sure. Um, but before we get to discuss the Lord of the Rings a little bit, um, before we conclude, I want to talk about something, an interesting, this is an interesting episode in Tolkien's life. And it's his interaction with two people that we've also met in previous episodes of The Authority. One is Hilaire Belloc, um, who was a, the subject of an episode, and the other was Father Martin Darcy, who we mentioned in the episode on Evening War. He was the priest who received Evening War into the church and the priest upon whom Evening War based the character Father Mowbray from in his novel, The Bright Side Visited. So these three come together. How do they come together? Well, Hilaire Belloc is giving a talk in Oxford on the Norman Conquest of England. Uh, and of course, for those of you who don't know, the Norman Conquest following the Battle of Hastings in 1066 is when the Normans invade England. Uh, and then for the, thereafter, the, 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 the nobility, the aristocracy, uh, the royalty of England speak French as their first language. Um, and uh, English becomes the language of, of the peasants and of the poor, not of, not of the court. Or, 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 so the academics and the clergy spoke Latin, the aristocracy and nobility and royalty spoke French, and uh, the peasants spoke English, uh, Old English. So Belloc, being uh, half French and being a Francophile, a lover of all things French, uh, said that the Norman Conquest was a, was a good thing. Uh, for England because it brought England into the fullness of Christendom. Tolkien was present at this talk and sitting right behind him was Father Martin Darcy. And Father Martin Darcy could see Tolkien getting more and more irritated at the way that Belloc was belittling Tolkien's beloved shire, in other words, Anglo-Saxon England. And Father Darcy suggested that Tolkien should actually raise some objections, but Tolkien was somewhat coy about doing that in public. So, the, the, but Tolkien's position was that, that Anglo-Saxon England was thoroughly Catholic before the Norman Conquest and did not need the Norman Conquest to become more Catholic. Uh, I am a great admirer personally of both Hilaire Belloc and J.R.R. Tolkien, but in this great divide, this great argument between the two, I am very much on Tolkien's side, that Anglo-Saxon England, the Shire, did not need uh, uh, an invasion of the, the Norman French to make it fully Christian. Let's, uh, we don't have much time at all to speak about the Lord of the Rings. We'll just say it's fundamentally religious and Catholic. I will say very briefly, before we move on to, 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 to concluding this episode, that the key to unlocking the Lord of the Rings is the date on which the ring is destroyed. The ring is destroyed on March the 25th. Tolkien is a medievalist. He knows as a Catholic that March the 25th is the date of the Annunciation, which is the date on which the word becomes flesh in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, the, the, the date uh, on, on which God becomes man. Um, but he also knew as a medievalist that traditionally March the 25th is the date of the crucifixion. So March the 25th dates both the birth of, uh, oh, the, the, the conception of Christ uh, and also the, um, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. The journey from uh, Rivendell, the Fellowship of the Ring, when they leave Rivendell to Golgotha, Mount Doom, uh, is the life of Christ. They leave on December the 25th, the birthday of Christ, and they arrive at Mount Doom, Mount Doom on March the 25th, the death day of Christ, um, the date of the crucifixion. So what's destroyed on Mount Doom on March the 25th is the ring. What's destroyed on Golgotha on March the 25th is the power of sin. So the power of the ring and the power of, the, of sin are the same thing. 
So then we can see that the, the one who wears the ring when we, is, is the sinner. When we put the ring on is the act of sin. If we keep the ring on, we, we, we shrivel and shrink and we golemize ourselves. We become addicted to the power of the sin, to the power of the ring uh, and become slaves to sin, as St. Paul tells us. But on the other hand, if, if instead of wearing the ring, we, we're not ring wearers, we're ring bearers. We are cross carriers. We are carrying the weight of sin without sinning. So there's much more I can say about the Lord of the Rings than I have, and I would advise you perhaps to either check out the Tang courses on uh, the, the, the Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which I've taught, uh, or, or my book, Frodo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings to go deeper. But we're going to conclude here with two things I want to say um, uh, about Tolkien to conclude. There's this wonderful saying, where his understanding of tradition uh, and the church when he said that I cannot understand the modern mania for going back to the so-called purity of the early church because I do not know why a, uh, a sapling is considered to be full, uh, superior to the full-grown tree. And he said, and even if the sapling is superior to the full-grown tree, if we chop down the full-grown full tree looking for the sapling, we don't find the sapling, we simply kill the tree. This is Tolkien's understanding of the of, of, of the church as the tree of life, if you like, that goes has gone through 20 centuries. Um, it's the same tree. It's essentially the same, teaching the same truths, and yet it moves through the centuries responding to whatever the particular uh, fashions and fashions of the seasons of the centuries are. And then two things just to sum up where he stood on the most important things. Um he was sent a, a, a letter by, by his publisher's daughter who was doing a school product, uh, a school project. This is 1969, so not long before Tolkien died. Uh, and the, this, this little girl asked uh, a school project, what is the purpose of life? So she asked him, and um, uh, the whole reply is wonderful, but I'm going to just conclude on um, the final two paragraphs of this. So it may be said that the chief purpose of life for any one of us is to increase according to our capacity, our knowledge of God by all the means we have and to be moved by it, to, to praise and thanks, to do as we say in the Gloria in excelsis, laudamus te, benedicamus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te. Gracious Agibus Tibi, propter manium, glorium tuum. We praise you. We call you holy. We worship you. We proclaim your glory. We thank you for the greatness of your splendor. And in moments of exaltation, we may call on all created things to join in our chorus, speaking on their behalf, as is done in Psalm 148 and in the Song of the Three Children in Daniel 2. Praise the Lord, all mountains and hills, all orchards and forests, all things that creep and birds on the wing. If anybody doubts the centrality of Tolkien's Catholic faith to, to his life and to his understanding of the purpose of life, as he puts it there, they need read no further. But we are going to conclude actually with one other wonderful thing that he wrote. And this is in one of his letters, and it's about the Blessed Sacrament. Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth. And more than that, death. By the divine paradox, that which ends life and demands the surrender of all, and yet by the taste or foretaste of which alone can what you seek in your earthly relationships, love, faithfulness, joy, be maintained or take on that complexion of reality, of eternal endurance, which every man's heart desires. I certainly can't top that, so I shan't even try. Instead, we'll conclude this episode of The Authority. Thanks, as always, for joining me. And until next time, goodbye 
God bless and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.